Um, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about Jenkins Remote Access API and my effort in making it available to as many technology stacks as possible. Um, a bit of introduction. Good day. My name is Clifano Subagio. I am at Clifano on Twitter and on GitHub. I'm from Shine Solutions down under in Australia. I've been a Jenkins user. Back then, it was called Hudson since 2007, back when it was just still cron on the web. And I've been an occasional contributor since 2008. So a little bit of uh, what's on the menu today. We'll start with uh, talking about a bit of story about Jenkins and I, and then we'll look at Remote Access API. And then I'll be introducing um, Swaggy Jenkins. So this is what I've been working uh, on and off for the past four months to solve this problem. And then we'll look at some integration demonstration. And then we'll touch on um, what's next uh, with the API effort. <coughs> so once upon a time, back about 10 years ago, uh, Jenkins Hudson first came out. It did the job really well. So we started using it in uh, the projects I was on, and it did everything really well, like build the package, compile the code, uh, ran unit tests, integration tests, solved lots of problems. And lots of other people are actually working on adding more features to, uh, to Jenkins. Um, and most people were working on the the uh, serious important stuff, you know, adding this SEM support, um, adding this additional build type. And I, I was thinking, um, what can I do differently? And I, I learned that, that um, Jenkins provides a number of extension points, and you can write plugins. So why didn't, do I, why didn't I do something a bit different? So I started with uh, a mission. My mission is to extend Jenkins. What can I do to make Jenkins more than what it's currently doing? And I started with a Chuck Norris plugin. How many of you have ever heard about Chuck Norris plugin? If this ever caused an installation or an upgrade problem, any conflict with the other plugins, I apologize for the past 10 years of pain that you have experienced. Um, for those who are who, not um, familiar with Chuck Norris plugin, it, it's a fun plugin. If the build passes, Chuck Norris gives you a thumbs up. It displays a bit of a, a joke there. Um, all Java programmers know that um, Chuck Norris can instantiate an abstract class. That's a widely known fact. And if your build fail, a badass Chuck Norris will show up and give you the pump. And another joke, Chuck Norris beard can type 140 words per minute. That's a known fact. And next up, um, I was looking at, uh, I found out that you, you can actually modify the user interface um, the, of Jenkins easily. So my, my next um, uh, play with it is uh, what's called the JavaScript games plugin. When you install the plugins, it, 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 it's a, a menu JS games on the left bar. And on the right bar, you can play Mario Kart and Tetris. So if you have a long build and you have to wait for your pipeline to finish, don't waste your time. Just install JS Games plugin, play Mario Kart while waiting for your build. So th this is really, th this is the plugin I wrote ages ago running on Jenkins 2.71. So kudos to Jenkins team for making things backward compatible for such a long time. So yeah, I was playing really badly there. Yeah, it's turn um, and obviously Tetris. There you go. It, it's really working. And, and then my, my next um, attempt to play with Jenkins is um, this is way before Siri. I was looking at how can I interact with Jenkins through voice? And I was looking at um, speakable items that's available on MacBook OS. This is just a simple plist file. You can associate voice input to, uh, sorry. Oh yeah, slides will be uploaded la later on uh, to both Jenkins web, uh, the Jenkins World website, and also I'll make it available on um, SlideShare. I'll put the link on Twitter as well. Um, so you can associate voice input to a set of link. So I can say open Jenkins, and it will open up my uh, 
Jenkins installation on the browser. And then I found out that you can also trigger a build through a GET request. So this is 10 years ago. You, can, you could still trigger a build through GET request. Nowadays, you have to do it through POST with um, additional token. And then you can run a build, associate a voice input with a trigger build GET request. So that's really primitive back in the days. Next up, a bit, uh, something a bit more serious. Uh, it's a Firefox add-on for monitoring builds, so you can um, track your build status uh, without checking your Jenkins website. Um, it also has um, a notification pop-up that can play um, a shattered glass sound if the, if the build actually um, broke. Um, and just a fifth one, just a bit of an example. So Nestor, uh, I wrote Nestor. It's a Node.js command line interface tool that interacts to Jenkins through Remote Access API. I'll, I'll show you a bit what it can do. It, it can apply some actions to Jenkins from the command line. So in this example, I'm going to put in a, a build command, then the build called brew coffee. So you want to brew coffee through Jenkins, and then you pass in a console flag. So it says, yep, the job was triggered. It's checking the queue, waiting for the job to start. So there's a bit of interactivity behind it. And then it will stream the console output to the terminal. So this is for those of us who prefer to type in from, from command line rather than opening up uh, a whole browser just to trigger a build. So let's look uh, a bit on what, what is Remote Access API. It's an API written in REST-like style. It's not real RESTful. It doesn't fully implement like put and de delete method. It has HTTP basic authentication, so your username and password will be um, passed as an authorization header. And uh, um, probably a year or two ago, it started introducing um, CSRF protection token as part of your um, action. And then you can specify whether you want to get the response in either JSON or XML. Uh, what can uh, the Remote Access API do? It provides some actions. So you can build, create, delete, enable, disable job. You can also copy job. You can create and delete a view. You can get the job and the views conf config XML. So this is way before Jenkins file was available. You can actually extract Jenkins jobs config XML. So I actually use this to templatize a job and then um, dynamically populate the parameter to build 100 other jobs that are similar to my first job. And then yeah, you can list the job status, check the queue status, the executor. So if you have a number of masters, no, uh, sorry, a number of slaves, then you, you get a, a list of um, what the executor status are. You can get the build console output, obviously, as demonstrated before, and you can get the Jenkins version. So let's look a bit deeper on um, what happens when a build it happen, when a build is executed and when the console output is streamed. So the first call is just building a job. So it passes the command as to the build. What's the job name? Uh, brew coffee in this case, and then uh, the console flag indicates that um, I, I want to get the console output stream. And, and then, oh, sorry. And next up is it checks the queue. So it will pull the queue status until the job is no longer in the queue. So if you have a, a set of busy executors, then this will wait until um, the, the job exits the queue. And then the last bit is um, it streams the console output in chunks. So rather than, because I know a number of builds actually produces 100 megabytes of log output. So rather than getting everything in one go, buffering them in memory, just split them in chunks and display them in a, as a progressive uh, action. So let's look a bit of what's happening in Jenkins when um, the, the command was executed. So let's say we have a client on the left and then um, Jenkins on the right uh, on the server. The, the first action when you, before you trigger the, the post build is to get the CRS, CSRF token from the CRAM issuer endpoint. So you send the request with your username and password authentication. Jenkins will respond with a payload that contains the, the token value and the token header. 
and then you trigger a post to actually start the build. So other than passing the authentication, you also pass the Jenkins Scrum header. So this is your CSRF token. The Jenkins Scrum name was part of the payload from the Scrum issuer endpoint. And then Jenkins says, yep, 200, all good. Let's say it's triggered successfully. And then the next call is to check the queue endpoint and see if the item is still in the queue. And just keep polling for this until it's ready. And then the, to get the stream console output, you send a request to progressive tags endpoint with your uh, all the headers. And then Jenkins will respond with the, the tags from the console output uh, along with additional headers that indicates whether there is more data or wi which starting point do you want to get the output from. So th that's how you chunk the output into a smaller manageable stream. So then I was thinking, um, if everyone has to deal with the request re response level uh, at that a lo lower level, then if you have a thousand users, a thousand users have to do the same thing. So I was thinking, wh why don't we look at client libraries? So here's an example of what the client library can do. It's not in any specific language. It, this is just a pseudocode. So let's say you can initiate, instantiate a remote access API, pass in your username and password, get the crumb, and then set the crumb for the ongoing API calls, and then start the job, check if it is in a queue, or get the console output. So this is just an example. And the idea is that rather than dealing with request response all the time, you have to. You can deal with the obviously uh, an abstraction of that at the API client library level, and um, it will be first class for your language. And there are actually existing client libraries out there. Uh, I just pick four common languages: Node.js, Python, Ruby, and Perl. And there are lots of libraries written, and more in other languages. Now, there are some challenges though with this approach. The first one is the lack of parity between clients because there are so many client implementation. If there is a new feature or an update to, the, to a certain endpoint, not all clients will be updated immediately and the, the effort will be um, independent from one another. And obviously for those of us who maintain any open source project, we're guilty of not being available all the time to I guess, merge pull requests or to uh, respond to an issue. So th that also causes the lack of parity between clients. And the last bit is really the growing number of technology stacks out there today compared to when Jenkins first came out, let's say 10 years ago. Um, how many languages could you run on JVM 10 years ago compared to today? How many new languages are out there really popular today, like Go, Dart, TypeScript? Um, Kotlin, and it just keep, keeps growing. And number of services out there, web services, cloud services, and they all have this different requirement for um, programming languages. So I was looking at how, ca how could I solve that further. So this is where I look at Swagger code gen. Um, so Swagger is a, an API framework, and it has a number of tools. One of them is called Swagger code gen. Swagger code gen generates code from an open API specification. You can define endpoints, parameters, and models. And the good thing about it, it supports 70 plus technology stacks. And it, it just keeps getting more and uh, newer and newer language support. And these are just some of the supported technology stacks. Not all of them, but you can see, like, probably you can pick the, the language that you use on your projects on that list. So that became my new mission. So I started with the idea of um, how can I extend Jenkins? So I want to move to how can I enable others to integrate Jenkins with as many technologies as possible? So this is where um, Swaggy Jenkins come along. So Swaggy Jenkins started with an open API specification. So this, is, this defines the endpoints from, the, from Jenkins Remote Access API. So the idea is that you can, if there is any change, you update the spec, and then you just rapidly update the spec and regenerate all of the client libraries. And there are obviously 70 plus libraries. 
I've published um, three packages thus far, um, the NPM client, uh, Node.js client to NPM, uh, Python package to PyPy, and RubyGems to RubyGems.org. Um, more to follow. Happy to accept contribution. And um, the, the link is github.com slash my username, Clifano, and slash swaggy dash Jenkins. You will find the code base from all clients there. So how did I build the open API specification? So I started with the simple stuff, right? Specify the info. What's the version? What's the description? What protocol schemes does the API support? So in this case, Jenkins supports HTTP and HTTPS. And what's the security implementation? It's a HTTP basic authentication. And then I specified the paths and points from remote access API documentation, set up, specify the parameters and what the responses are. Now, the challenge with this is that um, the response models are actually huge. If you have ever looked at the JSON payload that um, Jenkins Endpoint supply you with, it's actually a big one. And the, the whole open API specification ended up with almost 3,000 lines long. This is on GitHub, already available. And almost half of those lines are actually response model definitions. So that became the, the first challenge I had to solve. So on the left here, um, I have an example JSON response from a, a queue endpoint. And I have to convert that into the open API definitions in YAML. So as you can see, like um, the JSON file on the left, that translated to five different data definition models. Now, the other challenge is that since there are so many endpoints, some of them actually have uh, certain models being reused across different endpoints, and they're not always the same. And if there is any update to a certain model, then it will be a waste of time if I have to modify the open API spec by hand. So this is not for a, a human to deal with. So what I ended up doing is um, I wrote a command line tool to convert response to definition. So the idea is that uh, I could just um, collate all the JSON files, chunk them all into a directory, and this tool will parse the JSON file, identify the reusable models, and generate the, the data definitions for open API specification. So that resulted in 1,200 plus lines of definitions. And the idea is that if there is a change, if there is a new attribute, just regenerate the, the, the spec, the data definitions, and then regenerate all the clients. And these are the 70-plus um, generated libraries that are already available on GitHub today. So you'll find Dart, Go, Kotlin, um, various number of, um, yeah, probably your favorite languages out there. Um, so let, let's move on to um, the first demo. So this is just running Nestor on the command line on a MacBook. It's talking to Jenkins through Remote Access API using the generated um, Swaggy Jenkins Node.js client. So I started with an empty Jenkins insta installation. So there is no, no job. And then I, uh, I'll switch to the terminal. So I ran Nestor dashboard. So this should give a list of jobs, but there's no job. So it just says jobless Jenkins. And then it runs uh, Nestor version. Yep, version 2.71, and then it tries to run um, Nestor queue to check, is there anything in the queue? Yep, queue is empty, there's nothing. And then Net Nestor executor. So the instance only has a, a master, and it has two idle executors. So I have this make file that uses Nestor to create jobs um, using config XMLs. So I created some jobs called brew coffee, feed the cat, something of this as using Jenkins to, to do home automation, just imaginary um, home automation. So you can feed the cat, dim the light, wash the dishes, and call Lady Gaga, because Jenkins knows Lady Gaga. And then after you created the jobs, you run the dashboard, you get the list of jobs, and if you refresh um, Jenkins, you'll see all the jobs there. And then if I kick off the um, the 
the build brew coffee with the console flag enabled. Yep, you'll see the, again, um, checking the queue and then getting the, the console output stream. And then you can see at the bottom left, um, the, the job brew coffee actually jumped on the one of the executors on master. And then if you run Nestor dashboard again, this will give you the list of jobs with the brew coffee job status says OK. And then if you refresh the screen, it turns into a blue orb, so indicating it's a success. And moving on to the next demo, um, how many of you have triggered Jenkins build through voice? Oh, yeah, OK, one person. Two, 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 two percent. How about voice with a little bit of AI? Yep, OK. So API AI allows you to do that. So it's a service. Um, in, in this case, uh, I already created an API.ai agent that's hooked up to a remote webhook running on AWS. So the request will be sent through API Gateway to a Lambda function. And the Lambda function is using Python. And it uses, uh, it, it talks to Jenkins through Remote Access API again. And lo and behold, it's using the Python generated client from the same open API spec. Um, so the idea here is um, your organization, your projects might have different technology stacks requirements. Some might need Python, some might need Node.js, some might, some might be a Microsoft shop, right? So the open API uh, effort generates the clients to as many uh, technology stacks as possible. Um, and in this case, it's, it's using API AI, going through Lambda and to Jenkins. And this is what an API AI interface look like. You can specify some intents. Uh, I created one for each uh, Jenkins job that we created before. Uh, it doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. It's up to you how, how you want to um, construct your voice input. Um, so for each one, for example, brew coffee, I also added some example input. So rather than saying brew coffee all the time, you can say, please brew some coffee, or why don't you brew coffee? And you let API AI train those sample inputs so that it can understand uh, what you're going to um, say to, to the system. Um, but for this example, because I, I didn't know that um, I could use voice as the um, sample um, demo here. So I'm just using text-based input. Oh. OK, so let's look at the example here. So um, I was typing, please call Lady Gaga. And so behind the scene, it sends the request to the Lambda function, and that calls, uh, that proxies the request to Jenkins. So there is a response calling Lady Gaga behind the scene. And then um, time to vacuum the living room. So it says starting the Roomba in the living room. So uh, I'm pretty sure someday people will write plugins for Roomba for all these devices. And we can do some home automation from Jenkins in the future. And then probably the last one is, uh, why don't you wash the dishes? So starting the dishwasher. So the, uh, I think the, the future more and more devices and gadgets will have um, internet connectivity, and then APIs, and then you can integrate a number of them to Jenkins and use Jenkins as a home automation system. And if you go back to Jenkins, so these are the jobs that are actually running. Uh, one job is still in the queue, fit the cat, and uh, the other one is in the executor, and fit the cat job actually jump to the executor. So this gives you the ability to execute commands from uh, from uh, voice input and trigger Jenkins job. So, because uh, ideally, w when you want to launch, uh, let's say, a release into production, you can just say, oh, we are preparing um, release version 5.61, and then your CEO can say, make it so, and then it will deploy the whole system to production. So let's look at the last uh, example demo. So I'm going to use Slack. So I imagine there are many Slack users out here. And are you using Slack as the some Slack channels for managing releases? Yep, some people. 
Uh, yeah, so um, th there is a Slack notification plugin, but what I'm going to demo here is more about how you can um, use Slack to pass in input to Jenkins. So I set up a, a Slack outgoing webhooks, and um, the, the webhook can be turned into a bot if need be. And this time, it talks to Google Cloud Functions running on GCP. And since Cloud Functions only support Node.js at the moment, so lo and behold, I'm just reusing the generated Swaggy Jenkins Node client that was used by Nestor on the first demo in, in this um, GCP demo. And just to make it different, it's not just um, using Remote Access API, it's using Blue Ocean API this time. So this is the new API. So before going to the demo, what is Blue Ocean API? Uh, I imagine a number of you have already seen Blue Ocean in action from the other demos on uh, the booth and on, on the keynote presentation. So obviously, this API is a REST API used by Blue Ocean UX. It's currently still marked as a private API because it is still going to change probably a lot. Um, and it supports JSON Web Token instead of CSRF Token. However, it's not enabled by default at the moment. Um, in the future, it will be enabled by default. Now you can um, access some information about pipeline, run, queues, and logs, just like what you see on the UX. You can get information about user organization and SEM. So, um, and again, the fact that it is still a private API and it, it is still going to change, that's the benefit of specifying the endpoints in an open API spec because if there is a change, just regenerate the clients and then just upgrade your client. Um, so th that's one benefit of it. Now let's go back to the example demo. So I'm going to create a pipeline job this time. So this job has a config XML that simply um, call, uses a Jenkins file from a repo on GitHub. So that created the pipeline job. Uh, let's see the classic view of the job. Just a simple job, it's just doing a slip. And now let's switch to the Blue Ocean um, interface. Okay, so this is a new job. There is no run yet. So I kick off run. This is the first run. That's the run ID, run ID one. Started by me. And let's look, let's drill down the, the stage progression. So this is just a, a sample pipeline. Let's say you clone the code base, you resolve the dependencies, and then you apply some style check, code linting. And then after that, you run unit tests, because everyone runs unit tests. And after that integration test, just to demonstrate a little bit of what pipeline can do. And then you create a package. And then you deploy the package at the end. Done. So that, that's pipeline job run number one. So that is success. Now let's switch to uh, Slack channel here. So I have a sample test channel. And I'm going to call the Jenkins bot, Slack bot. Yep, that's the command, Jenkins. And then say replay pipeline called pipeline job and replay run number one. So it's like a rebuild in the classic view. So you're replaying the whole pipeline. And so, yep, okay, so it gets a response from Jenkins Slackbot like that the pipeline job has been replayed. And that's the replayed job number two. That's replaying number one. And it's, it's progressing through the stages again. So this is just one example of what you can do with the Blue Ocean API. All the documented endpoints have been um, spec'd in the Open API specification YAML. And um, yeah, th there are so many other operations that you can integrate with your Slack channel or any other services that uh, you, you want to use. Now, let's look a bit on what's going on behind the scene when I call it uh, replaying the pipeline. It's actually not as complex as the the plain remote access API bef uh, from the example before. Th there is no JSON web token yet. It's just a simple authentication header, 
send a post to the reply endpoint, and then um, Jenkins will respond with a 200 status success, and just need to translate that um, in, in the bot to identify that, yeah, it's a success. So let's see what's, what's next for this effort. Uh, when I wrote the specification, uh, Open API 3.0 wasn't ready, but about probably two weeks before finishing the spec, it came out. So it has lots of um, new features. So that's probably something I'm going to look at next. At the moment, the spec is still version 2.0. And in version 2.0, the JSON Web Token support is a bit of a hack because you have to uh, fake in the better prefix in the authorization header. With 3.0, it has a, a built-in first-class support for JSON Web Token. So that's one benefit of um, upgrading to 3.0. And folder support, it's, it's not there yet. So at the moment, the spec only cater for um, top-level Jenkins jobs. But obviously, th that's something I want to add as well, um, having fol folder support. And w what's the future of Jenkins API? Um, I've been chatting with um, some of the Blue Ocean developers and um, the new DevOptics developers. Um, there is an idea of um, switching to GraphQL to, to make the payload more lightweight. Um, as you can see from the previous example, the JSON response is just massive. And usually, the, the request doesn't need that those many attributes. You just need probably a handful of them. And then that should be it. So moving to GraphQL could help that effort. But that doesn't mean that um, the effort, um, what I call Swaggy Jenkins, is going to die off. Because um, whether it's using Swagger Open API or Swagger Code Gen, the, the concept is about having a, a specification that you can use to generate as many clients to enable all this integration from new services that might come up in the future. So whether it's GraphQL, or if it is GraphQL, then we, th there are so many GraphQL generators out there. So we just need to consolidate the effort um, to be able to just regenerate the clients uh, when a GraphQL solution comes out. Um, there is no, um, I guess, timeline yet on when that will be available. So I reckon Remote Access API and Blue Ocean API will stay around um, in the near future. So in conclusion, I've uh, introduce you to Remote Access API, a little bit on Blue Ocean API endpoint, and also um, Swagger Code Gen. The, along with the clients, generated clients um, on Swaggy Jenkins, and with some demo of talking to Jenkins through co from command line interface or from Slack channel or from API AI. I'm sure your organization have lots of other services that you use that you can integrate into, into your pipeline. So the idea is that um, when you want to integrate your services to Jenkins for your pipelines, you, you don't have to just rely on plugins. These APIs are actually a useful alternative. And I've been using it for yeah, almost 10 years to integrate various services on, on, on my projects. Sometimes some of the tools are internal tools. And you don't always have to write plugins. You can simply just call all these endpoints. And my hope is that um, all these generated clients can be useful for you to integrate Jenkins with your um, process and services within your organization. Um, so I'm these are some links, but I'm going to uh, upload the slide deck to SlideShare and to Jenkins World website. Um, so you can get the links anytime you want. Um, yep, so I think we have time for some questions. Uh, yep. Yep. Right, so that depends on the tool that you want to use. So. Yes, yeah, so the example uh, for Nestor, you can pass in a Jenkins URL environment variable. So people are using it to, let's say, switch between Jenkins instances or even programmatically iterate through all of your Jenkins masters. So just set the variable, run the command, set the variable, run the command, 
So you can manage um, lots, lots of um, Jenkins instances from just one script, just iterate through the, the hosting, uh, the URLs, for example. So, yep. Yep. Um, so that usually depends on the client implementation. So um, in Nestor case, it has uh, TPS and certificate support, proxy support. Um, and that also depends on the technology stack. Some um, requested libraries are probably not as complete as other technologies. So um, what Swagger CodeGen is trying to solve is to generate the clients and then pick probably the best um, request library out there for the stack. But having said that, um, I personally have not tested all 70 generated clients. And yeah, th that's where I'm hoping the community will help with um, at least testing them out. Yeah, but so to answer your question, um, I, I don't expect there would be problem, but I won't be surprised as well if some libraries might not be as complete as other libraries. Uh, yep, yep. So, so um, for the for the API pseudo code example, you can pass in username and password, right? That, that's how you lock down the the call from a specific user. In uh, sorry. All oh, right, assigning permission, right? Uh, I don't think the API currently has that support, but. Yeah, d definitely something we should be asking um, the API developers on Jenkins core to, <laughs> to support in the future. Yep. Uh, when you say remote client, do you mean going through remote API? Oh, yep, yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, correct. It, it's different. So that CLI is, was not built on top of um, any library like Swagger. So Swagger only solved the, um, the API definition and then generating the clients, the client libraries, sorry. And then it's up to your CLI client, whether it's the, like say, a Java one or a Node.js one, to, to use the corresponding API library to um, send requests to Remote Access API or Blue Ocean API. So it, it's actually different to um, the built-in Jenkins CLI. Right, so that can be locked down in two places. Let's say one for the API AI example. Um, I guess your organization can set up the user accounts and the permission accordingly. And then the next level is the, um, so in that example, it's, it's sending the request to Lambda. And then Lambda actually um, uses the API client to send the request to Jenkins. So that's another level of, um, um, where you can set the pr permission because you have to pass in the credential to make the request to Jenkins. So one example is that you can set a service account for API AI agent or webhooks. But again, it's up to you, your organization policy to um, yeah, split the credential or lock down the permissions. If you allow it to happen. <laughs> So technically, yes, but it's up to you to lock down the permission at the API AI level, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Yep. Uh, I don't think so, no. Yeah, so Jenkins log output it's just in plain text. Um, nothing stopping you from writing a plugin if you want to. Yeah.
Yeah, no, no. Uh, with Bucket and Jenkins in, in what way? Yep. Yep. Uh, I think there is a Bitbucket plugin, perhaps, or a way to identify commits and associate that to Bitbucket link. But um, yeah, um, uh, but nothing on the API level. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, if there's no other question, thank you all for coming. Okay. Much appreciated.